Hi there, I'm the Reverend Danny Crosby, a Unitarian minister serving congregations in Altrincham and in Ermston in the northwest of England. And I am offering this devotion as a, as a balm for the heart, for the mind, for the spirit and for the soul. It's, it's titled The Perfectly Imperfect Game of Life. And I'm going to begin with a piece called uh, Jigsaw by Harold Kushner. There must have been a time when you entered a room and met someone and after a while you understood that unknown to either of you, there was a reason you had met. You had changed the other and he had changed you by some word or deed or, ju or just by your presence, the errand had been completed. Then perhaps you were a little bewildered or humbled and grateful and it was over. Each lifetime is the piece of a jigsaw puzzle. For some there are more play pieces, for others the puzzle is more difficult to assemble. Some seem to be born with, nearly, with a nearly completed puzzle, and so it goes. Souls going this way and that, trying to assemble the myriad parts. But know this, no one has within themselves all the pieces to their puzzle. Like before the days when they used to seal jigsaw puzzles in cellophane, ensuring that all the pieces were there. Everyone carries with them at least one and probably many pieces to someone else's puzzle. Sometimes they know it, sometimes they don't. And when you present your piece, which is worthless to you, to another, whether you know it or not, whether they know it or not, you are a messenger from the Most High. Nice, eh? There are, are many puzzles and crazes, you know, that seem to take over public consciousness from time to time. You may remember this one. Yeah, do you remember this one? I'm not going to mess it up, actually. It's a, it's a Rubik's Cube. Every kid had one in the early 1980s. My family, of course, like every other family, had a go. I was utterly useless. <laughs> I seem to remember even the smarter ones in the family couldn't do it, even my brother. There were ways to cheat, and the most popular way to cheat, actually, was to remove the stickers and to replace them. Some people pulled them, to pull them apart and tried to reassemble them, but most of us really couldn't fathom it. I wonder, did, do you remember them? Did you have a go? Maybe, maybe you're having a go now. Interesting, aren't they? Well, the Rubik's Cube, it seems, is becoming popular once again. I was talking with one of my oldest friends, Nick, last Saturday night at a mutual friend's birthday celebration. It was, it, it's always wonderful to spend time with old friends, those who've known you through thick and thin. He began telling me how much his daughter is looking forward to seeing me again. Now, if truth be told, I know it's not to see me. It's to meet Molly, my, my beautiful little Havanese. Anyway, Nick then began telling me about his son. I think his son is a bit of a genius. I don't know where he, don't know where he gets that from. I remember when he, when he came over to Manchester with his two children last year that his son, Alex, had a, had a Rubik's Cube he was constantly playing with, which he showed me he could complete in no time at all. In fact, he even had what's called a stunt one where you can move the pieces a lot more easier and quickly. He's utterly obsessed with the Rubik's Cube. In fact, he's so obsessed and so good, he will be competing in the World Championships, which take place at the end of this month in Spalding in Lincolnshire. Nick says that Alex is incredibly confident. And you know what? I know why he would be. He can even complete... Re complete a cube wearing a blindfold. Amazing, isn't it? The, the cube's muddled up as it, as it normally is. They're given the cube to look at the, the, the competitors. They're then blindfolded and then they piece it back together perfectly. Alex seemed to be able to do it in no time at all. Blows my mind. So I get why he's confident. The guys, the boys are genius, it seems. He amazes me, and you, well, people constantly amaze me all the time, as I'm sure you're aware. 
Yes, we're all made of the same stuff, but we can be so different in ways that we see and in ways that we engage with life, ways that we experience life itself. I know I wouldn't even know where to begin if I was with this Rubik's Cube. This is why I'm frightened to death of making a start and messing it up, because I wouldn't know how to put it back together again. My mind just doesn't work that way. I would imagine, actually, if my brother's children got into the Rubik's Cube, that they'd, they'd be geniuses at it too. They'd probably be able to compete with Alex in the, in the championship, but I, I couldn't. I, I'm just not made that way. I, my mind just does not work through imagery and such things, really. I'm much more of an intuitive thinker and experience of life, and, and I know that my own memory of life is linked to, to, the, to language as much, to sound, actually, and language more than sight. I don't remember so much through imagery. It's, it's feeling and, and movement and, and sound, actually. I used to find this a bit of a puzzle, really, but I don't so much these days. It's just part of the beautiful tapestry, the puzzle, the jigsaw, whatever that is, it, that is life itself. We experience life so differently. Some folk love quizzes and games and stuff like that. In fact, a friend coming over tonight asked me if I wanted to play a, a game. And I goes, not really. Let's just go and talk and spend time together. We don't need other things, distractions. Another old friend who's coming to stay over, overnight. I've told him he's going to have to be up early in the morning, though, because I've got a service. I've got work to do. Board games are very popular once again, but they've never really interested me much. I'm much more interested in the puzzle of what makes each of us human and making sense of that mystery that's that's at the core of life, that spirit of life that I name God. You may give it other names. That, that, that something that's the essence of everything, including you and I, I believe. It's hard at times, though, to come to terms with life, particularly the horror and the suffering, which seems so unjust at times in life. There is, of course, natural horror, which we've no, you've no doubt witnessed, as I've witnessed, as the world's probably witnessed in Turkey and northern Syria this week. Thousands and thousands and thousands of lives lost due to the earthquake. We also see other suffering, corruption and all kinds of other human-made horrors. But at the same time, we also see the incredible things that we can do for one another, particularly in times of strife. The human response to disaster can be incredible. When someone suffers, most people are only too willing to offer a helping hand. There are many other troubles in life, too, that, that are hard to make sense of. See, life isn't a game. Life isn't a puzzle to be solved. It, reality is not some kind of mathematical equation or a, or a Rubik's Cube that can be simply put back in order once again. Life is not a jigsaw puzzle where we all have to, all we have to do is put the pieces back together to create that perfect picture like we have this picture to create. I suspect even if we had all the pieces and we had the picture, I still don't think it would fit together perfectly and neatly. Life is not some game of perfection or perfectionism. Nothing is life is complete. There is no such thing as perfection. Life is not a Rubik's Cube. It just isn't. Now be prepared. This might shock some of you, but it seems I'm not mad after all. And here is the proof. I am not mad. I cannot draw a perfect circle. Now I know this test may not hold up in court, but I do think the test is revealing. Now, of course, it's not one's ability to draw a perfect circle that's the, the true test of madness. Perhaps actually the true test of madness is to, is to use that as a test for madness, to try and draw a perfect circle, to prove you're mad or not. The true test of madness is to keep on trying to draw the perfect circle or to think it's possible to do so, really. The circle is not perfect. It shouldn't be perfect. It's not complete. It can't be complete. 
Life's just not like that. It's not some kind of equation or Rubik's Cube that you can piece together perfectly. And one of the great plagues of humanity, of course, is this search for perfection. Both perfection within ourselves and within other people, really, and life itself. How many times, I wonder, have I rejected either myself or others or life itself for it because it did not offer perfection? How many times have I noticed others doing the same? It is a lot easier to see this in others, by the way, than it is sometimes to see it in myself. We can be so blind to ourselves. Nothing in life is perfect. Life is always imperfect. I'm pretty much convinced that's how life's meant to be. Now, imperfection is one of those interesting words. Of course it is, isn't it? That doesn't mean exactly what it always meant. When today we say that something is imperfect, we're usually making a judgment about something, suggesting that there is something wrong with it. In so doing, we are making an error. Of course we are. Imperfection comes from the Latin imperfectus, which actually meant incomplete. So when we say that, some, that, that we are imperfect, that others are imperfect, that life is imperfect, we are, of course, correct in the sense that nothing is complete. Life is not a jigsaw. Life is not a Rubik's Cube that can be completed. It's just not meant to be that way. The mistake that we've made is that in saying that someone or something is imperfect, we've suggested that there's somehow something wrong with them, when in fact, we couldn't be more wrong in making that assumption. Imperfection itself is what makes life what life is. It is the fuel, it's the energy of life, as it's through imperfection that the energy to create relationship is fueled. This need to create something more closer to completeness. Imperfection, incompleteness is one of the energies of life. It's what drives life. Brings my mind to that rather wonderful piece by Harold Kushner Jigsaw that I shared at the beginning of this devotion. I love the way Kushner explains why we are incomplete, that it is through our incompleteness that we draw closer together. So true, for we are relational beings. We do not live in separation and we do not live separate lives or we're not meant to. We are constantly seeking unity, to be yoked beyond ourselves. The word yoga actually means to join, to unite. It seems to me that all the great spiritual traditions, Eastern and Western, are in their own way pointing towards this. That the spiritual life cannot exist in isolation. That in actual fact to live spiritually is to live in relation. That there is a yearning within us all to find that missing piece. In so attempting to do so, by the way, we enable others to draw closer, to do the same. When we come together in love, we create the love we have all been searching for. Sometimes we do that through game playing, playing games, actually. I don't mean board games, although that, for some, that's the way it works. I played a little game this week with, my, with a load of my friends. I shared the following piece, it's just about to follow, called The Imperfectionist by Forest Church, with a whole load of my friends. It had come up as a, as a Facebook memory that morning. As I was about to send, in, to send the piece out, because I love it, I noticed... That when I'd originally posted it on Facebook, I'd made a typing error in the title. It actually read Imperfection Sit, not Imperfection Ist. So I typed it out of the book, the piece, instead of, I don't know, finding a way to just copy it. There you go. Sometimes I like to go the long way around. I made the error years and years ago, but I didn't notice the error at the time. But for whatever reason, just as I copied and pasted it into a WhatsApp message, I noticed the error as I read it through. So I added at the end that there was a prize for anyone who could spot the imperfection in this piece on the imperfectionist. 
The responses were wonderful and fascinating and very, very revealing. Many replied that they loved the piece but could not find the imperfection. They told me how the piece spoke to them though. Three of my friends found it immediately and enjoyed telling me that they'd found it. Several other friends suggested other mistakes, but there weren't any other mistakes. The only typo was in the title. One friend cheated after several attempts and several telling me that about certain errors. There weren't any, but they seemed to find them. They told me that, that they're, prob they're a problem solver, actually. And that's their job to solve problems. So they, they were going to solve this problem. And this friend, she did not give up. But eventually, so eventually she found it, but she found it by cheating, really. She basically copied the text into a, into a Word document and the Word document highlighted the error, of course. And then she told me what it was, but she at least she admitted to cheating. It was fun. It was really fun and very revealing. This person is like a dog with a bone when, when they got their mind on something. One or two friends are still looking for it. <laughs> Well, they were looking for the, for the rat. Well, unless they see this this um, devotion, they bother when I post it on Sunday. I loved the whole game, and I loved the responses that people gave. It just showed me the wonderful and fascinating diversity of people that I share my life with. Beautifully, perfectly, imperfect folk. It was also an interesting experiment in what people look at what they actually see when they look at something. How many people believe what they see to be true when rather than what's actually there. They, they perceive something says something rather than actually seeing what's actually there. We all do it by that way. So here is the, the piece, The Imperfection Sit by Forest Church. Well, you know, obviously it's not that. It's The Imperfectionist. The Imperfectionist by Forest Church. He wrote... The reason I've been able to produce so much is that I'm not a perfectionist. I'm an imperfectionist. I'm confident that everything I say can be improved upon by others. And that's my great strength because I know that it won't be improved upon by others unless I take the first step. When we only do things which please us or don't frighten us, after a while, fewer and fewer things please us. Over time, our circle of options diminishes until we are prisoners in gardens of our own making. The more decisions you make in your life, the more times you act, the more certain it is that you will be wrong. To be fulfilled, we need to recognise, all of us, that the world doesn't owe us a living. Rather, we owe the world a living. And in the brief time that is given us, we must somehow learn to give ourselves away. Isn't that just a wonderful piece of wisdom? Not perfect, of course, but very interesting. Life is a mysterious thing. Nothing fits perfectly together. It's not a perfect circle, but a perfect, complete Rubik's Cube that can be put back together in perfect order. It is messy, Sometimes confusing, it's made up of many, many pieces, some broken, some damaged. It's difficult to make sense of and to work out where everything fits, including ourselves. This need not cause us fear. This is the nature of reality. Our task is to make the most of what is ours, to draw our imperfect circles, to do our little bit with the pieces that we have, to place them together with others, to encourage one another and to bring to life that little mystery that I have come to believe is at the heart of each and every one of us. I name that God. In so doing, we make this puzzle that is life a little more loving and meaningful for each and every one of us. So, will you come and play with me? Will you come and play with me this beautiful game that is life? This perfectly imperfect game of life. Amen. I'm going to end with some words of blessing. We do not bless enough, you know, and we need to bless more. 
and we can all bless we bless when we give our imperfectly perfect hearts to life so may the spirit of love open our eyes may it shine light even upon the darkest of days may we recognize the sacredness of one another the sacredness of all life in all time and in all spaces may we experience the ground at our feet May we shake off our shoes and feel the earth, the ground at our feet, and know that all ground is holy ground. All life is sacred, including you and me. And may we bring this sacred vision with us. May we bring it to life. And may we do so in all that we feel, in all that we think, in all that we say, and in all that we do. Amen. <laughs>